This is Frank Consella with the Crest Beat is Home podcast, and this episode, my guest is Sean Crossan. Sean and I talk about his early days of skiing 14ers. This is back before it was quite as popular as it is now. And uh, we also spend a lot of time talking about an avalanche accident that he had a couple of years ago. And uh, if you're squeamish about hearing about injuries and things like that, uh, this is your warning because Sean and I uh, definitely get into it and don't hold back. So um, at the end of the show, we talk a bit about um, fishing and his son, Connor, who's an up and coming ski racer of his own. But uh, I hope you enjoy this podcast. And uh, I think it's an important one for a lot of backcountry skiers like myself to, to give a listen to. Okay, let's go ahead and get into the show. Today on Crested Butte is home. My guest is Sean Crossan. And Sean, tell us a little bit about yourself, where you're from, and how you got to Crested Butte. Um, I grew up in the East Coast in Pennsylvania. Um, and then I went to a ski academy in Vermont, Green Mountain Valley School, to ski race. And then I got into ski racing and I visited Western State to look at... Um, Going to Western State in 1987 was when I first came out here, the first year that they opened the North Face, and I pretty much wasn't really that interested in the ski racing, but the skiing, and that's (laughs) why I came out here, and then I went there for, and got an art degree. You did get an art degree at Western, and were you, did you ski race then or not? I ski raced for a couple races, and there was like three guys on the team, and basically it was too much traveling, and it was hard to do school and and ski race. Was that? I mean, that was back when it was varsity sport and everything. Did you have a, a scholarship and stuff too? Or? No, no, because there was three guys that had a scholarship, and I was number five. Oh, okay. I probably could have gotten one if I would have stuck around, but I got into um, doing the extreme comps. Okay. The first year I was in that, in 90 or 91, I forget. The, the first very, year. You did the very, very first one? Yeah, the first five. Okay. Okay. And yeah. how'd those go? Um, the first comp didn't go well because I like literally went off like a hawk's nest cliff and double ejected. <laughs> awesome. The first, you know, like I made it about 40 feet. Right. Um, but I think maybe 95 or 96. 95 or 97, I like got first the first day, had the fastest time, made it into the final, or the semi-final, uh-huh. into um, Sakatumi Cliffs. I had, I had a little crash, but they didn't notice, and then I made it to the finals, but I messed up my knee, so I didn't ski well in, in staircase. Uh, so I didn't make it to the final final. Gotcha. But I made it, like, I think my best was like 18th or something. Gotcha. Well, it's still respectable for sure. And we're going to get back to skiing, but let's let's just back up a little bit. So uh, you mentioned your art degree. So you still do art, and you're also a painter. So talk about talk about those two things a little bit. Well, it's kind of a, a wicked uh, dichotomy that I, you know, like <laughs> I would love to just do artwork, but, you know, in this town um, or anywhere, it's I have kids, so it's easier to make money painting houses instead of waiting around for a commission. Right. Right. Um, So we're getting a gallery and having to, yeah, it's a whole other, actually Woody and I had a gallery, Woody Lindenmeyer and I had a gallery called purple mountain gallery right when we graduated from Western in 93, 94 for two years. Oh wow. And we did framing and we sold a lot of our work and actually we were both very successful, but the, um, the owner of, the Somrock Rock Plaza doubled our rent from 600 to 1200 mm. after he realized that we were making money. And so that was short lived. Ah, bummer. Bummer. Well, that, that unfortunately that happens. Um, speaking of, of painting, so, you know, in the trades here, um, one thing I want to talk about so you bought an affordable housing lot in Larkspur and you were able to build yourself. Um, 
So talk about that process and the challenges uh, with, with building here in the, in the Crespi area. Um, actually, I, I think they wrote an article in the Gunnison Times about me because I had been the only person that had done an affordable housing unit that had built um, outside of town in the last two years. Okay. And basically, the hard thing is that um, they make a cap on how much that you make. So you have to like qualify for $62,000 a year as a maximum of what you make a year. Right. And then a year or two later when you go to build, no bank is going to give you a loan for building your house for because you have to make a build a house that you could actually live in. So, yeah. um, you know, it's probably three or $400,000. So you're going to have to make eighty to 100000 a year. For what they want to see for the loan. <laughs> exactly. Right. So... Um, it's a tough situation because it's kind of like you have to, you know, say one thing and then two years later do another thing. So, um, and nobody's going to give you a loan for property just to buy property. You're going to have to come up with cash for that. So then that's a tough thing. And then on raw property and then to, um, build it, it was pretty much impossible. And it took me almost two years to close my loan to a 30 year loan because nobody had built property. The banks wouldn't give me a loan to um, finance a 30-year loan um, because there were no comps. Okay. For anybody that who had were, that were sold. That affordable. And, and it had, nobody had sold a deed-restricted lot. Right. You know, because people hang on to them. Right, right. So what do you think the solution is? Do, should it be, um, you know, that maybe the Gunnison Valley regional housing authority that they offer the construction loan? Do you think that's a solution or? Actually I do. I think that would be if they could do that, mm -hmm. you know, and work with the banks because otherwise you're out there in the free market and people just, you know, it's, I went to three or four different banks yeah. um, and they would say yes. And then it wouldn't work out. And then I'd go six months later. And so I have to go through the whole process over and over again. But yeah, if that was possible, that the the Gunnison GBRHA yeah, yeah. exactly <laughs> could do that. You know, I don't. I know they don't really have have it together very well. Yeah, they, you know, they're kind of like they you know fly by night. But if they could do that, that would help people because the the solution to the problem is not getting places for people to rent because they're not going to stick around. They need p places for people that are you know have ownership because if you have an ownership in property you're going to do whatever you can to stay in this valley and work your butt off to make the loan and make your yeah. house nice and, and have a family and just do whatever. Yeah. But if you're just renting, you don't have any ownership and you don't have any um, means of why do I have to stay here? You know? Right. So right. once you have a mortgage and you own something, then you want to stay and you want to have that place forever. And so you work your butt off no matter what it takes, you're going to find work to make it work out. Yeah. Well, and some people do come just for a year or two and rent. And that's okay, too. No, there's we, nothing... We need, we need no, that, No, there's nothing wrong with that. <laughs> but we need both. Right. You know what I mean? Right, right. Yeah. In the affordable housing realm. Right. When you're saying that. Right. Which they try to do, but there are... as we, And that's why I wanted to ask that question. There are some limitations to what, what can... Right. I mean, there's certain market. developments that are being passed right now that don't have any ownership in their development. I'm not going to name any developments. <laughs> But I don't agree with that because personally that it should be involved in all developments that there should be some kind of ownership so that it's not a slumlord situation. Fair enough. Fair enough. Well, I wanted to completely switch subjects and we're going to go, go back towards skiing. And uh, one of the projects that you started a long time ago was skiing all Colorado's 14ers. Um, so how did you decide on that goal? And when, when was that too? Well... In 2001, I got married um, to Heather. We moved to Colorado Springs because she had a really good permanent job there in 2001. And um, I got a ski pass at Breckenridge, and I okay. tried to go skiing. And <laughs> I got in a traffic jam, and I tried to go to Copper, and I got in another traffic jam. And so <laughs> I was like... And that was a long time ago, way before... The traffic jams that are now uh -huh. up there on the on the front range and i was like i can't do this 
I, you know, on a week weekend basis because I worked in the weekdays. So I was like, I need to do something else. And I had worked for the Colorado 14er initiative and her and I had climbed 34 or 33 14ers okay. in the summertime. And then I had done trail work for the Colorado 14er initiative. So I was like, maybe I should try to ski the 14ers. Nobody else had done it since Lou Dawson. So I'm going to, you know, start a project. And I was going to try to do it in two years. And basically nobody was doing it at that time. Yeah, that there was, was pretty early for sure. There was a couple people that were trying to do it and they were doing it slowly. Chris Webster and his wife, Pam Webster. And then, you know, it was a small community and they were easy to like get in touch with to go skiing. How so, are you getting in touch with those guys? Actually, friends of friends on the, I don't know if you, it was the internet, it was email. Was, the, was there internet? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, there was, but yeah. it, it was not, not like no, the, it was, Facebook or My Instagram. friend Franchi, who was a guide at Irwin, hooked me up with um, Chris Webster the first time. Um, and we skied uh, Kit Carson together. And we hadn't nice. even met. So, and it was like a 19 hour day. Mm hmm. He didn't make it the last 250 feet, but I was like, I'm, I have to do it because I'm not coming back <laughs> <laughs> and charged the top by myself and came back down. There was like literally 20 inches of pow on the, on the couloir, but yeah, there were, it was kind of a fun project that I did. And before I had skied one peak, I already had six, six sponsors that my brother, who is a very good writer kind of hooked up with me along with me, Atomic mm, nice. and Red Bull and Smith and backcountry access. I'm forgetting a couple right now. So what what uh what were some things you learned along the way of that of that project? Um basically perseverance, you know, like it took an average of 3 tries per peak um on all of them. Okay. And then some of them took 7 tries. And then I also, I mean, my biggest lesson that I learned was how wicked the internet could be <laughs> uh -huh. and how People would write things on the internet that were, you know, they didn't care, you know, and like I always say it, write it, regret it, or, or say it, I'll, I'll remember in a second. Okay. <laughs> but um, anyway, people would say things that were just, you know, awful. And so I ended up going back after the first two years I did 27 and then 27. So I got to 53. But then there was an issue of a bunch of them. I hadn't done from the exact summit. So it took seven more years to go back and do 53 from the exact summit. And then the final one that I hadn't done was capital. And then I ended up not doing it because I actually went up with a bunch of friends to ski it and didn't feel comfortable that day and was a little more concerned about my kid, my son at the time and my wife and my reality of living and not dying. Fair enough. Well, and then obviously I was there. Um, so, well, what, what was what were the kind of things that people were writing on, on the internet? Was it just um, was it just the exact summits, or were there other things? Oh, well, there was the, It was mainly the exact summits. Okay. Um, but it was, you know, just people will say anything and anything. You know, there was this guy, um, Jason Ionic or Ivanic. Yeah. Ivanic. Yeah. And, yeah. You know, there were several other people that were doing it at the time and. It was just kind of a mess of, of words of what people would say or do and say they did this and that. And it, to me, it was more of for fun. Yeah. And not like a serious... It was a serious project, obviously, because I spent so much time doing it and, you know, it consumed me. And then um, the cool thing was that I got sponsored by Cloudvale and Red Bull. So I got to go to Alaska and do heli... Sh heli photo shoots and go heli skiing and mm -hmm. do other cool things. But, um, I basically started the whole thing for fun and it kind of like stemmed off to a project and got to ski with a lot of cool people. And then other people got into it after I had done actually 53, Chris Davenport called me up. Um, and he was like, do you, do you care, Sean, if I go and ski the 14ers and I'm like of course Chris you can do whatever you want you know right you're the pro of <laughs> pros you know and but you know he he was an awesome dude and at least gave me a call and said you know what's up because his first 14er that he had skied was with me and Woody and Wendy Lindenmeyer Wendy Fisher and we were skiing Uncompadre together but he's an awesome dude and he ended up you know skiing them in one year 
Yeah. And then pioneering a line that Pete Sauer and I had picked out on uh, Capital that we had tried several times down the face. Yeah. But the snow conditions weren't right. And, you know, those guys, he went with, I um, can't remember who he skied with, but the guy he skied with had climbed Everest twice and said that the line on Capital was harder than Everest. So, you know, it was respect to that. Yeah. Um, yeah, for sure. In this week's Crested Butte Real Estate Minute, I wanted to talk a little bit about vacant land and building on vacant land, since Sean and I talk about that a little bit. Um, as he discusses, there's a lot to think about when it comes to actual construction costs here in the mountains, and uh, it's often quite a bit more expensive than people realize. So just a lot to consider if you are thinking about vacant land and uh, construction costs. I do have some... Uh, tools that I use that I've actually picked up from mountain biking and skiing that that I employ when I'm showing clients vacant land and uh, love to help you if that's something you're looking at. Um, my name is Frank Consella. My website is crestedbeatrealestateagent.com and you can find my contact info there. I'd love to help you if you're looking for vacant land or any other type of property in Crested Butte or Gunnison. Let's get back to the interview with Sean. Moving on from the 14ers, um, you kept just skiing backcountry in general. Yeah. And uh, almost exactly two years ago, uh, you were involved in a pretty serious uh, avalanche accident. So let's just start from the beginning. So this was two years ago, so a big, big winter. Um, fairly good avalanche conditions because of all the snow. And you and Pete Sauer decided to go up and ski this thing up Copper Creeks. So talk about why you chose that line and, and how that day started off. Well, it had been a line that I actually, you know, Pete picked it out, but we had been looking at it since the early 90s because I used to go up to this place called the Zach Shack, which is below Zachary Peak. They call it um, Red Face or Red Mountain off of White Rock, but we call it Zachary Peak because there's a post up there that says you know Zachary and he was the miner that um, lived down there in Copper Creek and basically where's that post I don't think I've ever seen it yeah, it's right next to the El Nacho okay which we or me and a couple of friends pioneered El Nacho in 93 or 94 or something so like way that. up there there's just a post in the middle of yeah. the Dallas field yeah and it says Zachary okay um and you probably only see it in the summertime and you have to mess around. Maybe it's not there anymore, but um, if you look into uh, some mining stuff, Zachary was a, a guy that lived up there in Copper Creek. Okay, cool. And um, I think, I don't know if he died, they buried him up there. Or anyway, um, yeah, we went up to go ski that this line that Pete said hadn't been skied. I mean, most likely had not been skied. Mm -hmm. um, it's at the very end of the um the ridge line before you get to El Nacho and it goes directly northeast down to the first creek crossing as you come up Cocker, Copper Creek um yeah. right before the Zachary Shack okay um right before um Queen Anne's Basin Queen yeah. Anne's Basin comes down into an avalanche chute and then there's like thin, a thin layer of water on the on the road or on the trail yeah. You'll notice with the three little log crossings. Yeah. So the core comes down right before that. And there's basically three large cliff bands in it that you have to circumvent with, or if, if, or, um, if you ski it, you know, or okay. you climb it. Yeah. So you guys are at the top and what are the thoughts of like, what are the conditions and what, how are you guys feeling about, about this objective that day? Um, I mean, it was pretty windy, so our communication was, um, it was hard to communicate. And my first thing that I said to him beforehand was that I don't want to ski it unless I know that the line goes the whole way through. And, um, so he poked his way down in there and skied and circumvented around the cliff bands to a perch where he could see the whole thing. And he radioed back up to me and said, it goes. From the time that we started skinning in the morning, the conditions, avalanche conditions were moderate, which they were, but the winds came up and there were 30, 40, 
45 mile per hour gust. So I think that the, the wind changed the, the snow from the morning to the, when we skied at about one o'clock. Okay. I know it sounds weird that that can happen, but there was no wind for a long time before that. Mm -hmm. And so the conditions were pretty stable. I mean, moderate doesn't mean anything in a city out there because nobody's ever, nobody's been there. So sure. it could have been considerable. It could have been high. But when I was at the top with Pete, um, I basically was 50, 50 on skiing it because I didn't know the Kuar went the whole way. I didn't know the snow made it through the, the, the cliffs. So mm -hmm. he went and scoped it, but with the wind and it getting cold, I made a mistake in not knowing that he hadn't skied into the Kuar and actually cut the Kuar. So I thought he had actually skied into the Kuar and he was on a cliff band halfway down looking at it and saying it went. Okay, so instead he'd kind of like stayed to the margins, you mean? Yeah, okay. he went to the right and actually didn't go in the core. Okay, but at this point he sees the whole thing and he's he's optimistic about it? Or is he like, ooh, I don't know? Or he's like, no, no let's he, do this, this he, is good. He, he's saying it goes the whole way. The snow goes the whole way. Okay. You know, like there's snow, you can ski the whole way through the, the line. And that's that's what... My concern was, okay, I don't want to ski down to a 200-foot cliff and then have to hike back out. Okay, and was he saying, like, ooh, and then, then there's wind loading, too? Or was he, like, no, he, no, no mention of the snow? No. Yeah. Okay. All right, so, you, so you're so you going for it, and how many, what do you, is it, like, second turn, and this thing slides, or what's the deal? No, I, I skied the top, like, 10 turns that's kind of like an open area, and then it gets into, a, like, a tighter chute or couar, and then it opens into another room. And at that point, I, if I would have just cut it and went up to the left and stood on the rocks, it would have just sloughed because it wasn't a very big slide. It was um, probably 12 inch crown, you know, right. it wasn't a lot of snow, but it was enough snow on a 50, 55 degree surface. So I basically skied into it, um, the top 10 turns and then got into the tight part of the couar into the small little room and it took out my um the back of my skis so i started tumbling backwards okay yeah and what kind of surface was it was this like a hard wind slab or, or was, was this more of a powdered snow surface um it was probably it, there was wind wind hard wind sl uh slab on top and then when i got into the kuar it was a little softer and more carving carvable and then um basically um, what slid was the surface on top of a harder layer, um, and it was probably 12 inches of powder on top of a uh, wind-loaded base. Okay, so the surface underneath is hard, and that's yeah. what, and so at that point, you accelerated pretty quickly? Yeah. Okay, and so then what do, you, what do you remember about the rest of that ride? Well, the first thing I thought was, okay, here we go, I'm going to die. Yeah. You know, I mean, like, literally, like, that was my first thought. And so then I started fighting, um, but it was kind of futile because I couldn't slow myself down. I was doing 70 miles an hour instantly and bouncing. The The shoot was kind of like an, an S. Okay, so it's um, curving around. Curving yeah. around. So I hit one wall, then hit another wall, and then I went off three separate cliffs, probably a 25-footer, then a 30-footer, and then an 80-foot cliff. And I bounced maybe 40 feet halfway over the 80 footer. Yeah. Cause it my... wasn't a clean cliff. It was like a big, it was yeah. an ugly, not vertical cliff. Yeah. And so when I bounced, you know, I, you know, I could feel each, each time I hit a rock or the cliff wall and it slowed down, like literally, like they say, how everything slows down. And even though you're doing, going 70 miles an hour, it slowed down to like, you know, complete slow motion. Sure. And then I landed at the very bottom, um, probably 50 feet from the 80 footer. So I like bounced and then went, you know, projectiled. Which is probably good at that point. You're clearing it stuff yeah, at I least. Cl I cleared it. And then I was in about a foot of snow. I, I was like, oh my God, I'm alive. I can't believe I'm alive. And Because you're on top of the snow. On top of the snow. Yeah, because it's a small slide, so it didn't bury you at least. Yeah. And so I'm sitting there and I, um, you know, I'm seeing daylight after this, like the powder cloud had skeered, or cleared. 
And then I was like, I'm alive, but I lost my arm. And so I'm like, okay, where's my arm? My arm was, my humerus broke off and it was behind me. So basically I reached around and I felt my arm back there and I pulled my arm back in front of me and, you know, it kind of like crunched and popped and I pulled it in front of me so that, you know, I'm like, okay, my arm's there. And then instantly I saw a huge, there was a huge pool of blood. Okay. And so I was concerned cause I'm like bleeding heavily out of my arm. Mm -hmm. And then Pete's like, I got you. And I'm like, yeah, I'm here. I yelled back up to him. He skied around through the cliffs and then back down to me. Um, you know, and at that point I was like, just get down here because I knew nothing else is going to slide. Everything is slidden. Right. Or whatever you say, slid. Yeah. Slidden. 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 We'll go slidden. Slidden. Yeah. slidden. <laughs> Everything's slidden. <laughs> and so he came down to me and he saw my arm and the bones were sticking out of my jacket and blood was, there was a big puddle around me. And so this is compound out of your jacket even. Yeah. He's like looking at your bone. Yeah. And so okay. instantly I look at Pete and he looks at me and I'm like, oh no. You know, Pete's like freaking out. And he's, he's turning white and he's like, okay, what are we going to do? And I'm like, um, you know, let's tie this thing up. And he takes off his jacket, takes off his shirt and then takes off his, uh, or a long underwear shirt. And then we tie it up and then we take off another long underwear layer and then not tourniquet, but tie it up very tightly. Um, so it was slinged up and then tied up. And then he's like, I don't know what to do. And I'm like, call 911 and he's like well we're not gonna get cell service but 911 yeah. has a ping and you have a, uh, a heightened ping which i didn't know till then that if you do dial 911 way out there it goes through so he actually talked to somebody mm -hmm. in gunnison they said where are you and he said you know send search and rescue we're up copper creek like four or five miles and yeah so um, they sent somebody and then we went down a little bit and lost service. And so we thought, you know, we knew they were coming. And then I started to ski and realized that my ankle was broken too. But I had lost a ski and so I had one ski and then he had two skis. So he gave me one of his skis and luckily he had uh, demo bindings, which is rare on Dinafits. Yep. So we adjusted his Dinafits to my boot. And then, so I had two skis and he had one ski. And then we had to ski roughly 500 vertical more down or further down to the can the bottom of Copper Creek. Yeah. And so I had, I fell 1500 vertical feet um, from the top of the, the peak down to there. And then we skied down to the valley floor and then we had to go, or we started going down valley. And at that point he was like, let's just hang out at the Zach shack and wait for people to come. And I'm like, I'm just, I'm not going to do that because I'm going to bleed out. And so, you know, I could feel it draining on me and me getting dizzy. So how much, um, all right. So first of all, you're like wrapping yourself up with, with clothes and stuff. Did either of you have like a good first aid kit? Or no, no? Okay. I didn't. No. And how much first aid training did, did either of you have? I mean, obviously Heather, your wife is a nurse. So you had, must have picked up some, but I mean, you know, at, I I knew enough that I was probably going to die if I didn't keep going um, because okay. of the amount of blood loss that I was sustaining at the time. Mm -hmm. um, so is it slowing down at all, or is this just it's just a gusher? It just would fill up, and then we'd retie it, and then you know, like I think you know, looking back on it, I should have tourniqueted it, like you know, tied it way tighter. Yeah. And then, you know, with the cold, it wouldn't have, like, I wouldn't have lost my arm. Um, I don't know that, but um, people have said that nowadays when you have an injury like that, you usually tie it tighter and really tie it so there's no blood coming out. And above then, the injury. Above the injury, yeah. Okay. So, um, I mean, now I try to, I have, you know, I don't know the best first aid kit but I still I have way more gauze and stuff than I used to and I have mm -hmm. like an ace bandage and tape and but basically I knew in my you know bottom of my stomach that I needed to get out of there or I wasn't going to make it you know mm -hmm. 
And so then we got down, um, probably s- skied out about a mile and a half into this open field, and I, you know, started to kind of like lose it. Um, what do you mean lose it? Like, like you were even more dizzy, or yeah, I just I was like, I need to like not keep moving because I don't want to lose more blood and get more out of it. And then at I sat down and like put my down jacket on and drank some water, and I just felt like I was like kind of like fading it's a shock i mean then yeah. no no and now yeah that was, yeah. That was shock really setting in after the adrenaline was wearing wearing off yeah and you know after going down 500 feet and then a mile and a half and then i started to hear the snowmobiles and luckily they had high-powered snowmobiles up into the wilderness which whatever it takes um they were about a mile and a half past the wilderness line they got to me and then um jay and rob got me some uh a little bit of painkillers some fentanyl or whatever Mm -hmm. and then tied it up a lot tighter Mm -hmm. and they were like okay we're gonna bring a um sled to you and then we're gonna pull you out of here and i'm like i'm not gonna make it if we do all this i need to get on a snowmobile right now so i canadian with um can't actually remember right now um i got up on the sled and canadian and cross-armed and got up and out of the hole of Copper Creek and then down almost to Gothic. But then there was a side hill that they didn't want to go across. So we actually used a sled at that point and then went down, which it literally took like 40 minutes to get through there. Just that one little section. Yeah, one little section. And then we got to Gothic and then more painkillers and... They were supposedly bringing a helicopter to Gothic, which probably would have been the best thing at that time. I don't think they believed me that I had a, you know, compound broken arm that was in 25 pieces and my leg was broken because I wasn't really screaming or anything. Um, And they had no way of telling, but I could tell that I was fading. And, you know, in in the long run, I I had lost 50% of my blood. Wow. So I restabilized it got in a um, a big sled behind a snowmobile and they brought me to the ambulance at Snodgrass. Gotcha. So. And just to, just to circle back a little bit for people who aren't familiar with some of these terms, Canadian on a snowmobile is, is side to side, so there's yeah. one, one passenger on each. Um, and then a side hill is really hard to do without without some pretty good snowmobilers and good right. shape, so I can see why that was, was difficult. So, well, yeah, it was really rotten and they kept getting stuck. Yeah. Yeah, I could see that. So, so anyway, you mentioned some of your injuries. So you, you ended up, you know, going to Gunnison. They sent you straight to Grand Junction, and and how many? You know, it was what half a dozen surgeries, even more. Um, no, well, it was it was twelve hours of surgery, and I went in. Okay. The first thing I went in for, uh, I had a broken nose. I broke my ribs. They thought I broke a bone in my face, which I didn't. And then I broke my humerus off my arm, and then I broke my arm into roughly. 20 or 25 pieces my right arm my elbow and then my ankle and so they put two plates on my arm and a plate on my ankle and 31 screws wow wow and just to go back to some of that, our, our first discussion so you're you're still a painter how how does your arm and your ankle feel up on ladders and and painting um actually my arm feels fine um wow. Dr. Uh, uh, Coda did an incredible job on my arm. Um, nobody else wanted to do it, and he took up the task and put the jigsaw puzzle back together. Uh-huh. Um, I'm actually going to see him in a day to maybe take out the plate of my ankle. My ankle doesn't feel that great in a ski boot. Okay. And it's not mainly skiing. It's mainly walking across the parking lot. Sure. And then I can't jog. It feels great mountain biking. But, um, you know, just the fact that I can keep painting and I almost took a full year off from painting, um, it was six months till I could work again. Mm-hmm. So it was pretty rough financially, but I had major support from a lot of friends and friends that I didn't know that I had, um, that go funded me. And then I also had high five, um, foundation pay my mortgage for two months which really helped Huge. out a lot because yeah. I just built a house and I had a construction loan that was still going, uh, a house loan. So it was a double mortgage at that point and rent. 
So I was roughly paying, you know, almost $4,000 a month in, in rent. Oh, wow. And um, luckily I had a roommate, Pete. <laughs> <laughs> so he took care of the house that we were renting while I built the house. And um, it all worked out. And then um, Heather came to the hospital and helped take care of me for, I was there for 12 days in the hospital. Well, we talked about now you bring a little bit better first aid kit. What other lessons do you think you can share? Um, I mean, first of all is your second gut instinct or your first instinct that, you know, I think first of all, when he was like, do you want to ski back down and go back down the face um, of the mountain, you know, which was perfectly fine. It would have been a great tour back down, you know, Um, I think. First of all, I should have taken that gut instinct because when the winds came up, I felt like everything had changed, the snow, like Mm -hmm. it went from powder to it loaded. And then when it loaded, it just did that six or eight inches of surface Mm -hmm. tension that made it all go. Mm -hmm. Um, And then not being able to communicate because of the wind kind of fuzzied up our, our process of what we should do and I think I skied into it because I was cold and just wanted to get out of there instead of um saying Pete come back up here and let's get out of here I'm not Uh into it you know it's never you know who who cares about a first ascent you know if you're six feet under the ground you're never gonna it doesn't matter right um I've thought about going back in spring conditions and skiing that line when it's it's great on a perfect year and there's nothing wrong with that. But the, the main thing that I think I've learned is that, you know, when you get into a, a, a tight couloir, you should probably always cut it. Number one. Okay. And number two, definitely always follow your gut instinct. Yeah. It sounds like, I mean, that was the first thing you mentioned. So yeah. what about one that I've always thought about with your, with your story is, you know, if you hadn't had that cell phone, which you barely, barely had, it would have been a different story. Um, right. Do you carry a, a, a locator beacon yet? No. Yeah. No. Brittany and I started doing that last yeah. year. and It's uh, a great idea. I think uh, I think that's what we're, we'll be doing from here on out because so many places just don't, they don't even barely have cell service. They just have no cell service right. at even all. Even in so. the summertime. Yeah, exactly. Even on our bike trips um, and things too. So, All right. Well, that was... That was a heavy story, but let's uh, let's go back to um, let's let's talk about your son Connor. So, what's it like watching him as a ski racer, and and he loves skiing too. What do you think about how fun is that? I mean, that's probably the best thing that uh, has happened to me in my life is uh, getting to watch him go from the back of the pack to up in the front or wherever he is now, but. Um, when he started ski racing, he was literally last, and so and so was the Crested Butte ski team and um, Woody Lindenmeyer and um, a lot of my friends have um, changed that, and so have the parents, and so they basically have turned uh, a racing program around so that the kids are super fired up and. It's not all about big mountain skiing and these kids are awesome and they're starting to win races and they're starting to um, get noticed in Colorado against Vail and Steamboat and yeah, Connor's awesome and he's shredding super nice. hard. And then uh, one last subject I, I wanted to talk about, um, you're really into fishing and a lot of the fishing you do, you it seems like you like to hike a lot of times to some of these remote lakes and stuff. You want to talk about that a little bit? Well, yeah, that's one of the coolest things about where we live is that um, back in the early 90s, uh, we had a whirling disease epidemic in Colorado, and that's basically they were stocking all the high lakes with uh, rainbow trout, and they're not native to here. So they stopped doing that, and they took a 10-year break till 2001, and they started putting all native um, trout back in the high lakes. And the native trout is cutthroat and, and what else? It's it's the Colorado River cutthroat. Is, okay. Or that's what they're putting up there. Okay. And so they airdrop them or mm-hmm. they put them there by mule or they hike them up to like these lakes that are 11 or 10,000 feet. They don't really do well at 12,000 feet. All over 
all over Colorado, they've done the project with the different, there's four different cutthroat species in Colorado that are native. And in each area, they put them there. And so I go up um, with Connor and with friends and we hike up to uh, these remote places in wilderness or mountain bike and bring our fishing gear and camp and maybe keep a a fish or two, but mainly catch and release. And uh, it's a super awesome experience. The fish are beautiful, and then you're in a beautiful place with wildflowers, and it's it's super awesome. What, if you, you're willing to share, like what, what are a couple lakes that maybe people might be familiar with that you like to do that at? Um, I mean, the, the high lakes that I like to go to are, you know, like Copper Lake or... Okay. You know, which is up by East Rim Pass, yeah. like close to the side of your axis. Or, actually. you know, a really cool lake that's on Monarch Pass that it's all catch and release is Boss Lake and Hunt Lake, which you can mountain bike down to. Yeah. And yep. those are the greenbacks, greenback cutthroats. Mm. And those are just incredible um, fish up there. And you can hike up from the road or mountain bike and then, you know, catch and release. And there's like, hundreds of lakes around that have the cutthroats in them it's super cool well, let's start to wrap it up a little bit so crest butte is home for you so why do you why do you choose to make crest butte your home well crest butte is far from the city which or cities which i don't enjoy living in um, <laughs> <laughs> um but also it's like deep in the mountains and we have so many incredible backcountry peaks to ski or lakes to fish or mountain bike um trails there's literally thousands of miles as you know around here yeah and there's tons of trails that nobody rides that you know are more rugged than the normal ones that you have to hike a lot but i've made it my home also because of the people and the community and um it's changed a lot so certain times of year i i leave (laughs) (laughs) summertime in the middle of the summer i tend to go other places but you know that's what happens when in the last 40 years the population has doubled so there's not much we can do about that yeah well you probably learned a lot about community with your injury too and oh yeah maybe you would have gotten support elsewhere but but maybe not it's it's hard to say definitely not i had friends that i've had for you know 25 30 years and they all you know people that didn't say anything and never said it you know i i thank them but they never said anything or bragged about helping me or they just came out of the woodwork and supported me in, you know, large funds, you know, almost $20,000 of, of people helping me get my life back together. Yeah. That's awesome. Well, where can people learn more about, um, your painting company or your artwork or anything else? Well, you can always go to mountain colors. Um, they have my card there and, uh, they're my biggest, uh, champion for painting. And then also, um, my artwork, you can always, call or text me and then I will have uh, a show at the uh, Center for the Arts next year. I'm not sure exactly what month, but I'll advertise it heavily in their new galleries, which are going to be incredible. Yeah, no, it'll be it'll be really cool when, when that's all all finished up soon. Anything else I should have asked that I didn't? No, I don't think so. I think you hit it. All right. Sounds good. And one last question. Who else should I interview? Why don't you interview Pete Sauer sometime? He doesn't live in Crest Butte anymore. Oh, it's got to be a Crest Butte. Oh, we're going to see a Crest yeah. Butte local. Yeah, um, no, it's got to be Gunnison Valley. Let's see. Who would I think of that that is out there? And have you ever interviewed Gareth Van Dyke? Oh yeah, GVD, the snowboarder. Yeah, he's got so much enthusiasm for the sport. He does. He does. Still. You know, or Woody Lindemeyer. Yeah, he's the man. Yeah, there's two guys that perfect. I would talk to Woody about the ski program. Like, if it wasn't for him, there would, you know, he's changed hundreds of kids' lives in this valley. Literally, that's, that's a good record then for sure, for sure. Well, thanks so much, and uh, I hope that maybe you and Brittany and I can go and ski that Kuar and uh, not have anything to talk about at all, other than a good time. You can climb it from the bottom, maybe. Why not? (laughs) Depends on the day. Just like we used to do it. Right, right. Well, awesome. Thanks so much. Thanks for listening to the Crested Butte is Home podcast. My name is Frank Consella, and I hope you enjoyed this episode. 
please tell your friends and spread the word and leave me a rating if you did enjoy the show. I really appreciate that a lot. As always, you can find my podcast at crestedbuttishome.com, which also has real estate information. If you're looking for anything in the Crested Butte or Gunnison area, I'd love to help. I'll have a new episode in two weeks, and I hope you'll tune in then.